Telecast, the TV industry news review. Hi, I'm Justin Crosby and welcome to this week's Telecast. In this week's show, we fill the hole left by the cancelled Nappy Miami event by focusing on current developments in the LATAM content industry. My guests are Cesar Diaz of 7A Media and Fabricio Ferrara, International Business Director at Prensario International. It's all coming up on this week's Telecast. My first guest on this week's show is industry veteran, founder and CEO of 7A Media, Cesar Diaz. Welcome to Telecast, Cesar. How are you doing? Great, Justin. Thanks for having me on. Now, you're in Miami, right? I am in sunny Miami. Oh, sunny Miami. <laughs> and For those of us who weren't able to come to Miami this week, I'll give you the forecast. It's bright and sunny, and uh, temperatures are just wonderful. In Fahrenheit, I guess it's about 7-ish. It would be what? About 15, 16, 17 Celsius? Right. Okay. Thank you, Cesar. That's uh, that's fine. Just rub a bit more salt into the <laughs> sort of that wound there. We're all... We'll get into that discussion a little bit later on, but just thought I'd start off with that weather forecast. You know, lots of industry execs obviously were planning to make the trip to Miami yeah. from various different corners of the planet. Uh, first of all, first of all, tell us about your background, Cesar, because there's a, lots of people will be aware of you, of course, but others may not have come across 7A Media. You've been involved in many big distribution businesses within the Latin market for a number of years. Can you just talk us through that a little bit? I started off, and I'm an, an, an original from Venezuela, born and not raised. But started off with a Venezuelan uh, network called Radio Caracas Television, RCTV. And those were the, uh, I guess, the golden years of the uh, classic Latin telenovela, whom a lot of uh, industry people who uh, have been around may know that uh, the classic telenovela from Latin America had a, uh, had, a, had a boom era in the, I guess, the, uh, the, uh, the 90s, let's call it. They were already successful in Latin America, obviously, but uh, it was, uh, you know, back in the uh, 90s where it really boomed and grew out of its shell and went to Eastern Europe and and just basically captured or opened up markets there when Eastern Europe was opening up. And so we had quite a wonderful runtime. From from there, I, I jumped over to, uh, to Venevision, which was uh, the rival network, I guess, at that time. And that was a network that run by the Cisneros Group, who were very media conglomerate. And they started off several projects within their tenure internationally, uh, such as launching DirecTV in Latin America. Uh, and they later bought into Univision here in the U.S. Uh, Spanish network. From there, and having you know uh, participated, I guess, in, in exploiting that uh, boom of the telenovela, I then uh, went to Telefe International, the, the network in Argentina, and also began exploiting and selling internationally their telenovelas. And um, eventually came around, Telefonica or Spain bought into that and went to work with them. And then at one point, you know, like a prodigal son, I went back to Ubenevision and ended up um, my career there, you know, 22 year career with them until, you know, the industry changed and Things happened, and uh, so I launched uh, 7A Media and went independent as a one-man band, just trying to, I guess, uh, calm things a bit. Did that and launched it in 2015. So from there on, and I guess I'm, uh, yeah, I'm getting into my seventh year as, a, as an independent and having lots of fun with that and still covering a lot of the Latin American market and their needs. It's always fascinated me. First of all, why why are telenovelas so popular? And you you talked about Eastern Europe, why they're so popular in Eastern Europe. Why do they travel so well? And and what are the other markets around the world for telenovela? Telenovela in Eastern Europe, it came in at the right time and the right place. It just evolved uh, from there. Uh, I think it was the right time because these... Uh, Eastern European bloc countries were opening up and they were, you know, just happening to be in their, you know, launching and celebrating their independence 
from, you know, in their political situations. The television industry was at a dire need for content in those times. And here came along a content that was long running. You could air it every day as a storytelling process that you could air Monday through Friday. And most important with it, with a storytelling, it was a love story, an impossible love, something that people would watch or hear and then just get captivated and, and root for the good guy and the bad guy. So it was always that. It was the rags to riches story of, you know, a poor girl who, I don't know, through the through luck and whatever comes into uh, a different role and all of a sudden uh, from, from being extremely poor came in to be very wealthy and then had the love of her life. So all these stories intertwine and it just made it incredibly uh, interesting and, and, and audience gathered ratings on it. So it fit the perfect time in there. And from there in, in Spain, it also had their boom. So every territory went by having their own recognition. I don't, I don't want to say that this is a unique type of format or story or, or type of content, but I mean, in the U S it's the, the, the typical soap opera that's been on for gajillion years. And now the same type of storyline or the underlying is is working in other territories. I mean, for now, I think most of us are quite clear that the Turkish are enjoying a beautiful boom of their product or their contents. But if you look at the storylines, they're the same type of telenovelas that Latins you know, have been producing and other territories have been producing. So I guess it's a nature, human nature, to seek and to follow that impossible dream, that rags to riches story, the Cinderella type story. And uh, that's a good point about Turkish uh, industry in telling the villas. Now, they're now importing their shows into South America as well, aren't they? Oh, yes. They're very much uh, uh, enjoying a healthy boom here in Latin America. And they, they have been for, for quite some time now. As we were talking about Nappy Miami and the cancellation of the event just over a week ago, there's pretty much been no Latin markets for about two years. And we know that the streamers have hoovered up you know lots of subscribers during the pandemic how have a the lack of markets and b the streamers coming into the region affected buying trends in latin america just a a slight observation on the comment that there haven't been any markets for the past two years which is it is true although in november of last year a couple two and a half months ago we did have uh, mip cancun oh yes uh, which had also been absent for, for not quite the two years, but a year and a half. And, then, and they had a, a, a presence or a face-to-face market much more slimmed than their previous market. I think they, the mention was that oh, about half the, the, the attendance on it. That was a, a very good positive sign. I did not go, unfortunately. I, I couldn't make it. But I did hear a lot of the comments and followed up a lot with the, with the buyers and sellers. And the general overall comment was very, very positive. So that sort of led up to, you know, Natby was saying, well, if, if Cancun had, you know, that situation at Natby, it's going to be grand. On the second part of the question, yeah, I think definitely the the, the whole industry worldwide has changed a little bit with the oncoming boom of the streamers and all the new platforms and and latin america is no stranger to that either we've been impacted the big guys or the big boys are now going directly to consumers uh with all the streaming platforms and so that yeah it's it's had an effect and and an impact on, on on the other fellows either free tvs or the or the pay tv channels now so it's now, uh, you know, all hands on deck to uh, to meet up and try to uh, exploit the, in in whichever way we can, you know, uh, whether it be getting to the to the big platforms to who are streaming so that they can also have content for it, or, and 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 feeding or trying to meet the demands of you know the other players, the free TV stations, which are now seeing less content available because the studios are reserving a lot of their uh, first windows. And what about fast channels in Latin America? Have they made the same sort of impact that we've seen across many other territories in 2021? It's interesting about fast channels. I mean, my particular, very personal view is that they may not be uh, having 
or for Latin America, is, it hasn't come to their time. It's true that consumers in Latin America would rather view something and, and be able to look. At, it doesn't matter uh, to viewing their the ads uh, rather than paying a subscription on it. But I think fast channels are still not up to par in Latin America in terms of timing. Maybe next year or, or later on for this year. But things travel so much. So, so there's a, there, we're getting bombarded with all kinds of uh, options to view different types of channels. So, so Fast Channel is just is yet another formula. But still, there, there's so much more to see still in, in Latin America rather than already having you know, the recourse to go to a Fast Channel to view old shows, I guess. Tell us about 7A, what you're currently working on and, and what's what's selling well, what you're finding is really connecting with networks and viewers. In a general aspect, the local Latin American productions in whatever format they may be, but basically either as movies or series, is what's attracting the platforms and the streamers at most. There is a, a, an incredible amount of creative talent all around the region, and local production is at, a, at an all-time boom. And so there's great stories coming out of the, the region. That's basically the main thrust where things are happening the most. Uh, and in formats, uh, in terms of uh, game shows and whatnot, are also very popular, even though they're not Latin America. I mean, they're they're the the typical game show formats that you're looking at that, but yet that is driving a local production as stimulus. So there's a lot more local production happening in the region. And with that said, I mean, as I mentioned in the first part, that has driven a creative talent or a pool of talent to develop new uh, ideas and be able to, uh, to develop them. So that's something where I'm also trying to get into. We're trying to develop a, a couple of shows and see if that's going to be working. As everyone knows, is into production. I mean, the production takes a lot more time and a lot more dedication and a lot more, uh, you know, grinding at it. But uh, certainly worth the while in the region. We've seen local content really becoming successful globally. I mean, uh, I, I guess Squid Game over the last few months has been one of the biggest international hit we've also seen money heist uh, doing extremely well do you think about now is the time for a south american show like that to really have a breakout international hit do you think that with all of this new production that you're talking about we can expect to see a brazilian squid game for example or a argentinian squid game do did you expect to to see that in the coming uh, months and years ahead yeah, and uh, sooner than later, we've already uh, seen a good top-rated cast move into Hollywood or establish themselves in Hollywood. We've seen uh, foreign movies from Latin America and from uh, Spain or Spanish-speaking movies make it into the Oscar game. In television, I'm not surprised that you know we'll get a uh, obviously maybe not uh, as a successful as a money heist from Spain, but certainly, you know, something that will, you know, uh, be able to uh, gather, you know, momentum and, 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 and success. Uh, I, I don't think that's far off. We talk about, you know, where the hot new regions are for format development or production. We've seen obviously South Korea an amazing success over the last couple of years. We've seen Belgium be a home to lots of successful formats. If we talk about the LATAM region, if you were to put your money on a territory spawning these sort of hits, is, is it as just simple as probably come from Brazil because there's literally a much bigger industry or Mexico or or is there a particular region that you think is or, or territory that's really interesting in terms of the type of the show and, and perhaps their approach to program making? I think uh, you hit it on the nail. I think Brazil by itself, it should be should be dealt separately because they're just such a huge market. Their quality of production is exceptional and now very affordable. Moving that aside and, and respectfully giving the merit that they deserve, they, they, they do deserve it. Then in the Spanish-speaking Latin America, I think Mexico obviously is, is leading that pack in terms of 
production in terms of uh, costs for to produce and also in terms of you know production entities which are coming out with incredible creative ideas you know it certainly seems to me with all of this uh local production boom that you mentioned that it's definitely a a region to look out for and i'm I'm sure you're looking very closely to make sure that you were you know you catch those early formats or those early shows is there anything that you've got on your uh books in your catalog at the moment that you think has got the potential to uh to be a big uh, global hit well like i said i'm working on a couple of productions that right now and there's one particular uh big project unfortunately i can't go too much in detail because there i've got ndas signed all over the place but again stressing the fact that local creative content with an international flavor with a uh, latin american themed locale or justification for that that's the main thrust on that hopefully there'll be something going and in terms of you know ready latin america is also that's not to say that latin america still does not feed off the international markets or the contents the international content so in that role i represent various a couple a couple of companies and so we're always looking towards the inside i guess to feed the needs or meet the needs of some of the uh, broadcasters whether they be uh, free tv or you know cable or even the streamers there's always need for content. It seems to be an insatiable appetite for content right right around the world. Thank goodness for that. Yes. But unfortunately, no markets to sell them in. With, you know, Nat P. Miami cancellation, for a company like yours as an independent sales and distribution business, how impactful is it on you that, that the event didn't go on? And I know everybody's dealing on Zoom and everybody's doing back-to-back Zooms and have been for many years <laughs> if i mean it is yeah. years now isn't it do you think it'll have a major impact on you or now able you're able to focus on another market in the future and see see what opportunities there are along the way to me and i'm sure to many colleagues the true impact of not having a market is is not really that grave or that serious or that damaging and we are certainly you know uh, hungry to have a face-to-face type of market because of, I think it's more of a, a human nature. I miss the, you know, the face-to-face. I miss sitting down with a client and my, by gosh, now we'll have anecdotes, all COVID anecdotes all over the place to have, you know, you know, enjoyable conversations and laugh. But it's just that relationship, that face-to-face that just seals that extra hundred yards when you're sitting down with a client. As you mentioned, I mean, I, I'm a bit, I'm a bit saturated on Zoom calls. I mean, I, uh, so now with the, with the, with the video call, it's a 365 year around market. I mean, it, to have a market or not to have it is really not going to damage a, a sale or not. You, you'll still be able to pitch it uh, and do all, all, all that you need to do without the market. But yet, that feeling, that human nature feeling of sitting down with somebody shaking hands you know it's a let's have a drink let's have lunch dinner breakfast whatever that whole aura in the negotiation this the the art of the the negotiation is what's lacking here and and that's what we miss the most or i miss the most we are eager and hungry to have you know these markets come back but does that mean that we're going to be selling less I don't know. I don't think so. But uh, does it mean that the relationship will nurture, will capture new clients or, you know, meet more people or, you know, expand your network? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Perhaps it uh, impacts on that that new business, if you like, and those, uh, those exactly. new, new opportunities. Yeah, Or to expand your network of, you know, people because you meet clients in all these new markets, you know, in some way, shape or form, be it a cocktail at a gathering at a bumping into a hallway, somebody introduces you to the, them. That, that particular situation you don't have with Zoom calls. Yeah. What's your next attempt at a market then? <laughs> what's, your, what's your plan? Is it in the States, presumably? Something, in the, oh. something domestic in the States? Let's look at the COVID uh, variant trend map. Here in the U.S., we're at the peak of the Omicron, which experts say should be dying down or tithering off in the next couple of weeks. But yeah, we're hearing all this new fluorona 
type variant. What? I haven't heard of this. What's this called? Fluorona. Fluorona. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that's not um, really. That, yeah, yeah. Uh, so if that were to be something that is going to spark and take off, then that means that, uh, I don't know, maybe by March or April. So I don't know, but my hopes up that by that at least at MIP we should we should have something that would be, you know, interesting to to go to. So I don't know. I, I mean, it's, it's it's something that now I'm, I'm more uh, hesitant to commit to a market so early on. So we'll just it's it's a wait and see situation. But nonetheless, I mean, as I mentioned, we're hungry for this type of market. We are, we are eager to attend. And I don't know. I mean, the, the markets obviously change in that situation and all the protocols that need to be in place. But, you know, reputable firms such as, you know, the MIPS and the NAPIs, um, you know, I'm sure that we'll start to have later on the second semester of, of this year. I'm sure we'll have something for sure. We all look forward to uh, to seeing our friends from all around the world gathering together at, at various events. So uh, let's keep our fingers crossed that that we don't get any more of those uh, those variants. But looking forward to twenty twenty two and ignoring COVID for a second. But do you see any any major trends in the in the region, Cesar, that, that you can share with us in terms of in terms of buying trends, in terms of content trends? For Latin America and the region, I think that, that I find more and more companies, especially streamers, looking into uh, having content that comes out of Latin America, original Latin American content, whether it be movies or series or you know uh, scripted shows, but there are more from Latin America, which uh, uh, we've been talking about it. You know, it has sprung off all these uh, all these uh, original productions coming out of the regions. That's going to strengthen uh, the need for that type of content. Sounds very healthy to me. It sounds like you know, as a as as a result of streaming boom and and uh, indirectly of COVID, then local production seems to be uh, a good place to be at at the moment. Uh, I I think so. I mean, I, I'm I'm we're doubling down on that. See it to see if uh, you know it continues in a healthy trend. And now it's time for story of the week, the TV industry news story that's caught my guest's eye in the past seven days. What's your story of the week? Well, I think it's too obvious to have nappy cancellation as a story of the week because it's just it's happened. I mean, we can't we can't hide away from that. So looking at something else, though, I'm looking at how, you know, the SVOD services are shaping around in Latin America and just sort of saw the news or caught the news that, for example, Netflix is is raising its prices, you know. Just looking at the whole media of SVOD in Latin America, how many SVOD services are we in Latin America going to be able to afford? Uh, that caught my attention several months ago when I was hearing a radio show here exactly on that issue. And, and they were uh, interviewing a person who had decided to cancel their cable bill because they were paying sort of like $290 a month for cable. And so they, she said, well, I'm getting rid of this and just going to subscribe to two or three. So I'm going to subscribe to HBO and I'm going to subscribe to Netflix. And she started off doing that. And then uh, another service came up and said, oh, it's $4.99. Let me do that uh, again, $4.99. And then another service came by. And then at the end of about eight or nine months after that, she was finding out that she was paying 200 plus in all type of SVOD services. So she was, she, it was like, you know, it was a turnaround. And going back to the same uh, issue of spending that much amount of money. In Latin America, I don't think that people are going to be able to enjoy that many services or be able to subscribe to that many services. So so there's obviously going to be a bottle, or even if there is right now, there's a bottleneck as to how many services can you actually subscribe to in Latin America, where obviously the, the majority of the consumers may not have access to you know, uh, being so frivolous in spending so much in, in, in services and stuff. They, Latin America, they'd rather, and it's been proven, the, the polls do mention or give out data that they'd rather, they don't mind watching at commercials in lieu of not having to pay anything. So I wonder, you know, how many SVOT services are, 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 are going to be able to uh, continue to increase their pricing in Latin America? 
Mm. You know, it goes back to what we were saying earlier on. Is it surely that that would say enter the fast channels, right? Enter AVOD. Sure. If consumers are used to watching ads, they don't mind it. They're used to that on cable, etc. So, you know, sh- there's certainly enough content. Maybe we'll see the uh, the market catching up the rest of the world when it comes to to fast. It's certainly an opportunity for the AVODs, yeah. And is that is that something you'd ever consider, Cesar, for yourself, is setting up an AVOD, you know, in terms of building that sort of platform and service? I remember I'm a one-man band, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I wouldn't be able to put it, do it myself, but I certainly, as a consultant, sure, be able to uh, get in with other entities uh, who may need a little bit of, uh, you know, a knowledge of the Latin American scenario or, or landscape. And that's where I'm most helpful at. And now it's time for Hero of the Week and Get in the Bin. Hero of the Week, again, tough one. But there's uh, right now in the UK, Boris Johnson is getting clobbered with all the uh, parties that were happening at uh, number 10. Uh, while they were on uh, rules and, and, and uh, of restriction, uh, so I think he's just the hero of the week because he's just uh, you know getting punched all over the, the place. And so, <laughs> all right, okay. <laughs> and many people would say whether the heroes are the ones who are giving the punches. <laughs> That's I leave it open. <laughs> okay. Well, if if Boris Johnson is a hero, then who are you telling to get in the bin? <laughs> On the other side of the spectrum, I would guess, or halfway around the world, we're not, we're seeing the uh, Djokovic and the Australian Open. Um, uh, Novak Djokovic. Yeah. Yes. Um, I respect the sport. I respect him as a player. I love watching him. He's a great player, there's no doubt. But as I've heard many reports and many people say, uh, at one point, you just cannot be above the game. And unfortunately, I have to part with that too. I mean, and I don't think it's fully his fault. I think there's been a screw up there and he's getting the wrong end of the stick. But nevertheless, you're the protagonist. And so you're getting all the heat for it. it this should have been resolved totally different. I think he pushed the issue, and you can't. I mean, at one point, you got to say, this is, and he said it. It's not about me. It's about the sports. Yeah, but you were there. You should have pulled out, you know, and and, and, and gotten off with it. So, unfortunately, you know, it, it's what it is. But but certainly that shouldn't have happened, the way the way it was handled. Yeah, well, also, there was, there was a report that I saw that he'd also – been out because he's obviously not vaccinated which is a, one of the main things but he's also been out uh when he actually had covid as well it was found out that he'd actually been. i think it was an interview or in uh, in belgrade i think it was so unfortunately he's painted himself into a bit of a corner i think when it comes to the whole vaccination scenario yeah yeah and again i, I again you cannot be above the sport i mean uh uh, you got to, I mean, the rules are rules and you got to buy by the rules sometimes, you know, yeah. especially if everybody else is, you know, doing it. There's a lot of controversial, there's a lot of opinions, but then, you know, it is what it is, you know, and it's tough. It's, but, but unfortunately he's going in the bin. Yeah. <laughs> he's going in the bin for the second week running, actually. Haley Babcock oh, really? last week put him in, uh, put Djokovic in the bin. So there you go. Oh, That's okay. a, a double yeah, fault yeah. for oh. Djokovic. Oh, All right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Listen, thank you so much for uh, for joining us from sunny Miami while we're all freezing, the frosts on the ground <laughs> and the rains falling oh in goodness. London and the rest of Northern Europe shivering away. So uh, enjoy your uh, your lovely climate. Uh, sadly, we can't be with you. Believe me when I tell you that I wish Nappy would have happened so all of you could have come down and enjoyed the weather and the business. Well, it would have been a great way to kick off the year, which it often is. Next year, we look forward to seeing you next year in uh, in the region, and I'm sure that'll be uh, much a sweeter for the for the long wait. Again, thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it. My next guest this week is Fabrizio Ferrara, international business director at Latam TV industry publication Prensario International. Fabrizio, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much, Justin, to be invited here. It's uh, such an honor and for a second time. So we are very happy. Thank you. We were going to be at NAPI this week. We know about that. And we're, we're, sadly, you're in Buenos Aires and I'm in uh, 
the UK. And I was looking up, and it's the, the the first and the last time you came on the show was July 2020, which is nearly 18 <laughs> months ago. Feels like only yesterday, but it's amazing how quickly times fly. How have things been for you, and how have things been at Prensaria? Because I remember our last conversation. You know, there was there was uh, all sorts of difficulties in South America with COVID and various different governments' approaches to vaccinations, all that sort of stuff. Well, well, you know that South America and Latin America in general, we are used to to be unstable, <laughs> so we are very very aware of every things of the economy and the pandemic. Of course, we take care. Situation is very, very under control in, in, in many countries, specifically uh, talking about the vaccination. But, you know, this virus changes and now uh, most of the key economies like Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, Colombia, they are being heavily, heavily impacted by, by the Omicron. So most of the situation is still uh, running as, as usual, but the governments are taking more precautions on, on, on flights and on how the people need to move. Uh, of course, the yeah. most important thing on this side is economy, uh, which is not so good as, as, as used to be. Now the situation, of course, is getting better because the industry started to, to recover their numbers. But of course, we are expecting a, a full opening by, by the second half of the, of, the, of the semester. We are all hoping that, as, as I said at the beginning, we, we are not able to secure anything at this point. But I believe that if we talk about uh, audiovisual industry, the situation is much better compared to the 2020 and the previous year to, to the pandemic. The last time we spoke, a, a number of the big streamers had just launched or were preparing to launch. So we've seen all these big media juggernauts launching their, uh, their streaming services. Um, have we seen the same level of success for SVODs in LATAM as we've seen in other territories and regions around the world? Well, I think the situation is, is pretty similar in, in other regions. If we compare in numbers of, of the increasing subscribers and in, increasing uh, users of this system, in 2021, we, we saw the launch of Star Plus from Disney, uh, which is a very premium SVOD uh, with sports uh, and, and, and very, very top serials and movies, which is launching a lot of new production, original production this year as well. And we also see the launch of HBO Max. Uh, you know that Latin America was the first territory, international territory outside the U.S. to be launched first. So it was a, a great honor. And I think that uh, the platform is doing very, very well. Uh, we also have other independents and we also have other major uh, to come, let's say about Peacock. Nobody knows when it's going to be launched from NBC Universal, but the the, the system is is, is uh, starting the rollout interna- internationally and it's doing very very well as well. So we are here, and and most of the the majors like them, but also Amazon and Netflix, they are uh, increase a lot the production level and the production number, and this is one of the reasons that the industry in Mexico, Colombia, Chile, Argentina, and Brazil are very active because the number of original has increased a lot. Really. I would say that uh, due to, to, to many aspects, mainly because of the number, of the bigger number of operators, but I would say that almost double our production if we compare to 2019. So most of the production companies or production houses are offering their services there are more places to produce, you know, there are more incentives like Uruguay, like Colombia, Mexico. So there are new countries that are uh, taking more seriously uh, to incentive and to do uh, cash rebates systems in their country. So I think that the field is very good. And for the future, we expect a lot of production from these players. Uh, I would say that between now to 2025, uh, most of them will produce almost two or three digits in terms of, of, of uh, production uh, development. And not only drama, because this is something important. It's not only serials or, or movies. We are also seeing a huge investment in docu-series, docu-realities, entertainment formats, variety. I mean, most of these streamers are thinking beyond 
the drama production. So really, you think the impact of streaming has been very positive to the Latam region overall? Yes, and I think that uh, it's, it's, it's very common to find talking with people of different targets and different ages, and they have adopted very well these digital uh, players. Uh, I can tell you about my father, who is almost 65, and he talked to me about Pluto TV as it is a very easy system to, to use. And I was surprised at the very beginning because um, even though the companies, Viacom CBS, they did a, a huge investment uh, with, with Paramount Plus. They launched the services in, in 2021, if I'm not wrong. They also launched Pluto TV uh, in the previous year. So everything was very very interesting in terms of marketing, but the, the people of age, they they really find it useful and very easy to, to find content. And this is something I, I, I get surprised every time uh, and it's something to be, to be highlighted. Uh, the other thing is that, of course, we have the broadcasters, we have a, a lot of, and another huge uh, amount of, of players like Linear TV on, on the pay TV or, or the free world, and they also have to adapt it. Of course, uh, the number of original productions uh, increase because they need the local taste, they need the local uh, feedback from the audience so they can be secure on that field. But they were also uh, impacted by the, by the advertising market, of course, so they need to readapt their strategy and their programming. Uh, not, not, not all the broadcasters are the same. But I can say that as, as, as a general trend that most of the, of the TV channels, local and regionals in these territories from Latin America, they adapted the, the situation to more local and more regional formats, um, variety, uh, magazines, and, and they increase the number of those uh, shows on their grids. I wonder, the, these legacy media companies, you know, how have they dealt with these, these seismic shocks of no advertising, and then all the streamers coming to camp on their backyard. But have there been any major mergers and acquisitions happening across the region, or have you seen it more about they're they're reacting by becoming more hyper local in their content output? Well, I think we have to divide the legacy media companies in two groups. On the first side, we have the traditional broadcasters, which are very local or very regional in, in, in these countries. We can mention uh, especially companies in Central America or the Indian region, of course, in Argentina as well. But we also have the other big groups, you know, like Globo in Brazil, like Televisa in Mexico. In the South Con, we have Viacom CBS with Telefe. And now, since this year, with Chilevision, the number one network in Chile. So we have different kind of broadcasters or what they used to be a broadcaster. On the first group, on the traditional linear TV, what we are seeing is that they are more focused on two topics. First, the one I mentioned, which is original production. Most of them are adapting uh, international formats and they are producing their own entertainment formats. Not yet drama, but they are focusing on, on, on formats for the, for the prime time. And second, they are trying to make more digital. They are launching their own TV Everywhere system. They are offering more content online. They are producing exclusive content for social media. So I am seeing the reaction of the streamers impact in that way. And on the bigger group, what I'm seeing is that they are moving faster. They are adapting more to the trends. They are acquiring more assets, like I said, Viacom CBS with Chilevision. Not only that, they also acquire the production company in Colombia called uh, Telecolombia and Studios Telemexico. So they added thousands of programming hours to Paramount Plus and to create new channels on Pluto TV. So what I'm saying is that merge and acquisition still moving, apart from the big ones, of course, we are expecting to, to see what's going to happen with Discovery Plus and Warner Media's uh, HBO Max. Uh, everything is about to be, to be, to be done, Not, nothing official yet. Uh, and I assume that there are more uh, launches to be to be done in the next couple of, of months and, um, and year. But I would say that the focus now is on how to create content, how to be relevant as a production company or a, as a creative 
agency for these big streamers. And I can say that the five top of them are, are very active on that side. On the distribution side, following with the streaming uh, business, they are also very active on one business, which is distribution. Of course, uh, they are big brands like Disney, Fox. Well, sorry, Disney and Fox are, one, are the same. But I would say Disney, Viacom, CBS, everything is all together. It's very clear for the audience. But they need still to be um, partnering with telcos, with pay TV operators, e-commerce. You know, there is a, a big e-commerce in Latin America called Mercado Libre, which is our Amazon. And they are also very active looking for partnership with HBO Max, with Disney, and distributing these apps to new clients all around the, the, the territory. So this is something very interesting as well. So in terms of disruption then, uh, have we seen any significant disruption in any particular territories? Or do we? are you feeling that all the territories in LATAM have, have generally adapted pretty effectively at the same sort of time as a result of these, uh, these changes brought on, on by COVID? Well, I can tell you, Justin, that disruption is, is the, new, the new game here. If you are not disruptive, if you are not fresh, if you don't produce something original, you are out of the, of the business. So what I'm seeing is that there are many examples we can mention. There is one which is very interesting to, to analyze. is what happened in, in Brazil with Globo. You know, Globo is a, a very traditional uh, player with almost 70 years producing telenovelas and dramas. And, and I remember the last time we were talking together here, we were with one of their sellers uh, talking about the, the trends. But what I can say about Globo is that they definitely changed the scope. They had in the past the broadcaster, you know, in Brazil is a huge market when you have one, one rating point is one million people watching your, your, your series. It's, it's a lot of, of people watching that, that movie so, or, or that series. But when they when they decided to to, to reinforce the global play, uh, their OTT and Xbox uh, system, they decided to put the digital first. They did, decided to create originals first to be developed and launched on global play. And this is something very disruptive. It is not something new. It's, it's something that has uh, one or two years, but it's something that changed definitely the market because they first uh, launched the program on OTT for Brazil and for the world, because they are also rolling out the service in the US and Europe, and then they launch it in Brazil. So this is something very interesting. If we consider that almost 60% of the people in, in, in Brazil is more focused on free TV, on linear free TV. But we can also mention some examples in other parts of the world. In terms of contents, there are much more examples. But in terms of business, I would say that that the, the one from Global is a very interesting to, to highlight. Uh, that was interesting. And, and yes, Angela Colo, we were talking to her on that, on, yes, on that show back in uh, July in 2020. And we, uh, she was telling us about how that was developing. But uh, fascinating. Okay. So uh, when it comes to content, Fabrizio, well, have you seen... Any super successful shows or formats in particular launching during COVID in LATAM that perhaps might never have worked otherwise? Well, we, we can always mention the, 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 big, uh, the big shows that were not only successful in Latin America, but also around the world. Let's say Netflix, Squid Game or Money Heist with the last season, HBO Max Succession, Euphoria... Uh, from Disney, we can mention, of course, The Mandalorian or Loki or other from the Marvel Universe. Uh, but we also have the, the, the original series. We, we have recently access to a study from WIT Media who indicated that there are some shows from Latin America that are, are traveling very well, not only in Latin America, but especially outside the region, like the original Netflix drama series Who Killed Sarah, who was produced in, in, in Mexico, or the Brazilian series, fantastic series called Invisible City, or, of course, the, the, the two biggest examples from Amazon Prime, which are the El Presidente, whose second season is being launched this year, and, of course, Maradona, Sueño Bendito, the, the, the biopic from, from Diego Armando Maradona. So I would say that most of the, of the, of the streamers are very focused on creating this unique and original content but not only 
international topics, but also very local, very, very regional, because, you know, local programming is something that they have found is the key driver to increase their, their subscriptions. And it's not only in the field of the regional, because, of course, they we produce a lot of that, but also in, the, in, in terms of acquisitions, they are acquiring local content, which is available on their streamers, uh, and they are also doing very well in that field. So I would say that uh, if we have to talk about success right now, I would mention those from big streamers. We also have local successes like Telefe here in Argentina with uh, the third season, second and third season of MasterChef. But I would have to talk about very local or very regional things. If we talk about the region in general, I will mention these titles. In your viewpoint, how big a blow was the cancellation of Nappy Miami for the the industry in the region? Well, you know, there are many aspects to to analyze. Uh, of course, I would say that the majority of the industry would be, was expecting Nappy as, as Nappy Miami as the very first a meeting point for the business and the industry after pandemic. But unfortunately, this variant, Omicron, it made it impossible. It was very risky to have all these people in, in, in Miami at this point. So what I can say is that most of them say, okay, this is, this is not the best scenario. But then suddenly uh, they understand that they should transform their physical meeting into virtual. And something interesting we analyzed is that even though the market itself not the, was, was not having any uh, digital platform to replace the physical market, a, a market was created. And from Pensario, we made some surveys with distributors, with producers, and with, uh, of course, streamers and buyers. What the majority of them say is that even though the cancellation was made, they had their meetings. And there is a reason for that is the, the true reason of that is that there's a bigger need of content from all players and all screens and also their new content to be sold. So the market was created naturally. And I can tell you that during this week, we are uh, receiving information from this uh, survey that is saying that uh, between 10 to 20 companies, sorry, sorry, 10 to 20 meetings are being done each uh, of them. So this is an average number, of course. But we also found the situation is not only concentrated this week. They already have meetings the previous week when the market was cancelled, and they're going to have more meetings after the market. So what we are seeing is that the frontiers of the events and the trade shows are not only focused on one week, two days, three days. Most of the people, they have integrated the virtual meetings to their day-to-day business. And this is something that we are going to see much more uh, in the next years, for sure. So I'm guessing, Fabricio, the next time I'll see you might be MIP TV in Cannes. Will you be making the trip over in April? I hope to. We, we, are, we are very keen to, to be in Cannes again for, I would say, yes, it will be two years from now on because we, we were not able to go to 2020 MIP TV. Um, and we were not able to attend MIPCOM last year, but I, I think uh, Mid TV is going to take happen. It's going to, 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 to be happening again. Not sure. Again, they, they say the format is going to be different. They will integrate other other shows and other parts of the of different shows like Gun Series, like uh, E Bar and, and, and many, many things related to, to the new new technologies. So we are happy to to be there. Yes, definitely. Thank you, Fabricio, for coming on the show. Really great to to have you on and wishing you all the best for you and Prensario International. Thank you so much, Justin. It has been a pleasure. Thank you for for making me part of the the show. I'm very happy. Well, that's about it for this week's show. As always, I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to rate and subscribe to Telecast and share it with friends and colleagues. We've got a brand new website that includes exclusive feature content from TV's opinion leaders and journalists. They're all free to access. Just sign up on telecast.com. And why not sign up for our free newsletter, Telecast Plus? You can also follow us on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Telecast was edited by Ian Chambers and recorded in London. Until next week's show, as always, stay safe.